That's, that's extra. That's bonus. Uh, last week we're in Zechariah 1.6, and, and the, the idea that Zechariah was getting across was your fathers repented uh, because they were so sad? No. They repented because of God's word. Zechariah was calling them to be the people of God in the presence of God who was fully submitted to the word of God. If they said, oh, Zechariah, we'll act right, but it's because we're sorry, are they going to fail again? Yes. Likewise, in our life, we can't have true repentance without God's word. And uh, uh, this week, we're going to begin talking about visions and all the weird stuff in Zechariah and connect it to the book of Revelation, because Revelation is a sequel. We, we've seen the images before in this book, Zechariah. Uh, but i got to talk about this idea of apocalypse or visions or revelation in Scripture. So before we get to Zechariah 1 and Zechariah 6, I need somebody to tell me who this is on this next slide. Who is that? Shout it out if you know. Garth Brooks? George Strait. Okay, George, George Strait. Who here knows a George Strait song? Tell me a title. Tell me a title. What's, what's George Strait song? Oh, you're not going to help me. Help me. Oh, Texas. Oh, Texas. Oh, right. Pastor got a song about divorce. Excellent. Um, who here has been to a George Strait concert? Yeah, some of us. Some of us. Yeah. So, and, and here's, here, here's, let me start getting you in the right spot so you're not thinking about all your favorite George Strait songs. Uh, is in a concert, the goal is you are there to see the artist perform. What's George Strait going to do at this concert? Sing. That, oh, man, I got you guys hopped up. That you want to see what he's going to do. Is he going to sing this song? Is he going to sing his old album, his new album? Is he, what hat is he wearing? What? You know, what, what, how's it going to go? Is it going to be fire? Is it going to have a duet with somebody? You want to see the concert? You want to see this close to George Strait, you know? Who here has ever gotten in line early for tickets or early in line at a concert to get the right seat? You want to see. And so I, I think about uh, God's word and how we're saying, I want to see the story of God unfold. I want to see what God is doing in the world face to face. But oftentimes, and this is true for a concert, this is what we see. Anybody ever been to a concert like that? No. Yeah. You, you, sit, you, you don't get a very good view of George Strait. You get a really good view of the person's head right in front of you. And, and you get to hear them talking on the phone. And, and, and somebody's getting up to go to the bathroom. Can, can you get, I need to get through there. Is it, is it easy to be distracted uh, from what's going on on the stage? Yeah. 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 Con concerts, in some ways, in, in some ways, it's almost better to, to watch the recording later. You really want to see what's going on. And so it is in life, and, and even while we're looking at Scripture. We're like, those stories are so long ago, they're so far away. And in your life, you're like, what is God doing? I mean, he's, I know He's on the stage. I know I'm here to watch Him, but it's all these distractions. And so that, that's how we oftentimes approach and are even told the story from Scripture. Like sometimes Moses is really keyed into what's going on. And sometimes the people in Scripture, like, like Jonah, are just complete doofuses. You know, don't do like that guy. Um, but, but here's what we get in visions and apocalypse and, and revelation. This is how I think of it. Go to this next slide. It's a backstage concert. The perspective is reversed. All of us, all you guys are, are, are standing, standing out here, uh, are sitting out here looking, looking at me. Or we're here to watch what is happening on the stage. You would have a different perspective if you were hiding back there on the baptistry. You know? Uh, same thing at, at a concert. Uh, you can see what the drummer is doing. You can see what kind of jeans George Strait is wearing because you can read the label. Anybody here ever been to a backstage concert? Do you get to learn things you wouldn't know normally? But like, oh, you know, they, they bring this guitar out. I got to see what kind it was. Can it be a little distracting? Yeah. If you go, if you paid money to go to a backstage concert, you got invited to a backstage concert at George Strait, and someone said, "What well, was it? Awesome? Did you get to see George Strait?" And you said, "Man, I saw a laser in a smoke machine. Did you waste your time a little bit? A little bit, unless you're really into that sort of thing." In a backstage concert, you are still there to see the artist and the performance and observe it from a different angle and learn something new about it. You may, you're close enough, you can see how he's picking. His guitar. And you, you can see uh, how he's interacting with the other uh, musicians. And likewise, in Apocalypse and Revelation, you're getting a heavenly perspective. At a backstage concert, you get the perspective from a drummer. And in Apocalypse and Revelation, you get the perspective from an angel or from a heavenly being. Who, who here, I mean, 
you know, maybe some of you, but most of you, uh, on Tuesday last week, did you get shown the view of the world from an angel? No, not, not too many of us. We get our human perspective. So in Apocalypse and Revelation, there's often uh, heavenly beings showing us what is going on. But here's why I point this out. Is, is we're going to be talking about these. What are we seeing from the backstage perspective? But just like at a concert, and this happens a lot. You, you've heard the Bible studies on Revelation. You know, Jim just taught them. And it's interesting and good to talk about those details. You know, oh, do you, what about those numbers? What about those colors? What, what, are, what, what about that, that deep, what was that word they uttered? But in the same way, if you go to a George Strait concert and pay the money for a backstage pass, you get the opportunity for it. And you never watch George Strait. If you never pay attention to what he's doing, did you miss out? Yes. And likewise with visions, with apocalypse and revelation. If you can't say, what was God doing on the stage? You're missing out. You're not showing up to the show just for the smoke machines. You're there for the artists. You're there for what he's doing on stage. Um, so let's uh, look at the outline of these visions. Zechariah has, uh, in my perspective, eight visions. Some people divide it up more. Um, but remember, these all have a historical setting. This is the 11th month, the second year of Darius. Which Darius, was he a good king or bad king? Good king, yay, yay. Remember we did Cyrus, Cyrus, Darius last time? So this is a historical setting. And we'll talk more about what that setting means. But these, these all occur in sort of one 24-hour period. That's a pretty crazy night, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Zechariah ate a bad burrito. He, he got a lot of visions. Uh, most of us are really weirded out by two. He has eight. Um, and just, we'll run through all of these, but I want you to see is we're not pairing them sequentially. We're going to pair them sort of as they have a theme, and it'll be very obvious why this theme, this week's theme goes together. Uh, the first one is, is, is the horsemen, uh, which we'll read about today. Uh, come back, I believe next week will be on the horns and the craftsmen. Uh, and, and the man with the measuring line. And then we've got this beautiful one about Joshua, the high priest, who's a historical figure. But these first four visions, as we'll see today, are at nighttime. Now, are you more likely to stub your toe, unless you're really clumsy, at nighttime or during the daytime? Well, nighttime. Ryan's really clumsy. Although you did great getting out of that scene. Good job. Um, at nighttime, our vision is obscured. And likewise, these visions... Um, it's a little harder to, to pinpoint. Zechariah is sort of wondering more. He's saying, what is that? And he doesn't always get an answer. Um, but certainly Joshua is a historical person. We'll talk about what that symbol points to as well. But then for the second part of the visions, he's awake. And it's, he still sees weird stuff. He sees lamps. He sees eyes. He sees trees. But he knows the vision is about the historical guy, Zerubbabel. It, it, the angel says, this is about what Zerubbabel will do. And then there's the flying scroll, which we'll talk about what that means. The woman in the basket. But then Zechariah ends it all with four chariots. So question, Howard. The first vision is, is, is the vision about a horseman. What does a horseman ride? Horse. Horse. What pulls a chariot? Horse. A horse. Amen. Way to go, Howard. Howard has a crazy age uh, rage. Is that the name of it? Yes, sir. Yes, so he, he's got horses. He's got horses. Um, but yeah, they both have horses. And, and I'm reading these and wondering, why is, are they connected? Why is the Spirit showing it this way? Why is Zechariah re, uh, writing it down this way? Where it begins and ends with horses. All right? Do you want to find out with me? Let's see why. Let's see why. Um, but let's see. I said that these are, are visual. And so we're still going to stand for the reading of God's Word. But just open your Bible to Zechariah 1, 7 through 17. I know this is washed out a little bit. But because it's visual, I figured we might, we might try this, okay? Um, and I'm going to get help. I will not doodle one of these. I'll have a professional draw one for me. But this, this, was a, this is a drawing of this vision As before we read it. It's from the 1300s. It's Italian. It's only about 3 inches by 7 inches. But what animals do you see on it? Horses. Horses. And I, I, can't, I don't know how washed out it is. I'll, I'll tell you what you see there. Uh, later you can see it better on YouTube. <laughs> Um, but we're going to read these ten verses, and then we'll, we'll talk about them a little bit, and then move on to the next vision. But let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. Uh, you can be following along in your Bible, or you can try to identify the parts of the vision in the picture. Um, but let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Stand if you're able. Zechariah 1, 7 through 17. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechai, son of Edo, saying, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. 
He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, and behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. Then I said, What are these, my lord? The angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, These are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth remains at rest. And the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, against which you have been angry these seventy years? And the Lord answered gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. So the angel who talked with me said to me, Cry out, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion, and I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry but a little, they furthered the disaster. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry out again, thus says the Lord of hosts, My city shall again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. All right. Got to make sure you guys are tracking. The picture's still up there. But the picture won't help you answer this question. Is this vision a happy message for the people or a sad message for the people? What do you think? Oh. It, it's, it's happy. Yeah. Overall, he's saying, you're going to get comfort. The cities are going to be filled. The 70 years are coming to an end. Yay! Ever say yay? Yeah. This is a great vision. This is, this is good news that the Lord again will comfort. And so what we see, knowing from the history of Zechariah and Haggai, which we'll talk more in a second, has it been a while since they've had something to be happy about? Yeah. It's been over 70 years. Since 605, they've had big kings picking on them, bullying them, uh, tearing down their walls, tearing down their temple. At at one point, uh, just, just completely destroying them in battle. They've had rebellious kings. Hadn't been a good time. They have felt like losers. And Zechariah and his partner, Haggai, the prophecy just before this, get to declare to the people, God is doing something good. Renewal is coming again. And that's this first vision. But what's what's in this uh, vision you see here? And you can see some of this on on the screen. Uh, Let's see. Under those horses. Does anybody see any little twiggies? Does anybody see any little twigs? It's a little hard to see. It's easier to see back there if you turn around. That one's less washed out. Um... Anybody here ever seen a crepe myrtle tree? Anybody ever seen them? They're, they're all over central Texas. Whenever that pink stuff starts to fall, it's pretty annoying. I'm so happy we don't have any here on the property. At least I don't, I don't think we do. Um, but a crepe myrtle tree, which, that, you know, these are a type of myrtle tree. Are, are they something that you're like, man, this is so sturdy. If there's a hurricane, I would tie myself to this. Yeah. No, they're flimsy. Uh, but they do obscure. If all those blooms are out, if all those leaves are out, is it hard to peer through them? Yeah, because... All the leaves are right here on the ground. They're low to the ground. So once again, this is a nighttime vision, and, and the, the, what we're seeing is obscured. We'll talk about more in a moment why that is. But also to add to the obscurity, this, this drawing, this, this uh, thing from the 1300s, uh, doesn't tell us uh, in the drawing, but they're in a glen. They're in a gully. I mean, if you can see, or if you know us back there, we sort of got a dry creek bed over here, just, just behind our church. So imagine what the vision is, is is in the gully, there's these horses, they're sort of obscured, you know they're there. Now, and and we know that this guy, who's in the gully with these horses, uh, are they beginning a task, or are they ending? They're ending. They just got done patrolling one county? No. The whole earth. Is that a big task? Yeah. So another thing you don't see in this in this drawing here is these horses will be panting. Howard, if you run horses for a long time, is there any you know physical things that happen? They're, they're panting, uh, they get salty, they're tired. Yeah, it's, it, you can tell that horse is, is about done. So that's what we have here in these myrtle trees. They're hard to see that there's something lying in wait. And uh, we'll talk more about the colors in a moment. But are all the, are all the horses one color? It's like, this is, a, this is a, a herd of brown horses. Yeah. No. And what, what that is going to mean for Zechariah, what, what would immediately mean, is God has multiple things going on here. God has different tools in his backpack. 
uh, to address whatever's being addressed here. We haven't gotten there yet. We'll get there in this next idea. So Zechariah sees this stuff, and, and he says, who are they? I says, I'll show you. These are the ones who are patrolling the whole earth. And they say, we patrol the whole earth. And then the angel of the Lord, didn't. he says to the Lord, he starts talking to God. He doesn't say, okay, God, they patrolled the whole earth. What's next? Do you want to patrol, you know, the Mars or, or Neptune? What, what, what does he say? He brings it back to Zechariah's situation. He says, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you have been angry these 70 years? Jeremiah prophesied before the, the very famous, I know the plans I have for you verse. He prophesied just before that God is going to exile and punish and, and take Judah and, and Jerusalem away into exile for 70 years. So this angel is declaring something going on with these horses is connected with that. And the good news is God didn't say, nope, wait longer. What does he say? The Lord answers gracious and comforting words. So for his people, for those who the prophecy was, there's going to be 70 years. We understand that that time is, is coming to an end. And so it would be a very happy prophecy. Obviously, God's going to have to deal with some kings or, or things like that. Uh, but I have a question. And this is another way to reframe our mind. Horses. If we see a bunch of horses out there, are we thinking somebody is using that as a form of transportation? Or are we probably going to think that's probably somebody's hobby? Yeah. Well, how are you using transportation? Most of us use it as a hobby. You go to a special ranch to, to pay someone money to get to ride a horse. But in Zechariah's day, the poor people walked, and the military, or, or the people with means, rode horses. They, they were modes of transportation. They were modes of war. We almost never look at horses now and say, that's the cavalry, better be scared. We say, oh, what a pretty horsey. In the ancient world, you, if you saw horses... In wait, in a valley, hidden behind trees, you would think someone's about to get messed up. There's an attack about to happen. They've been brought there for a purpose. And, and we have that indication because what were they sent to do? Go graze? They've been sent to patrol. They're there scouting. They're assessing the situation. So who is God getting ready to attack? He says in verse 15, And I am exceedingly angry with the nations... That are rebellious? No. With the nations that have worshipped so many idols? No, that's certainly part of it. He says, with the nations that are at ease. Who's, who's the top dog king? Who, who does it say in verse 7? Darius. Under Darius' reign, Babylon has been defeated. Uh, the, all the people they have met, captured have been sent home. There were many people in the world, even Jewish people, that would you would you would say, who saved you? Who is the one who has brought peace to the world? And the people would chant, Darius, Darius, he's brought peace to us. But God is reminding in this vision that, that this peace, there's a falsehood to it. This peace is, is coming to an end. Those nations and, and how they have their peace, it has not brought the spiritual goals that God had. And so judgment is coming. We'll see that more in the next vision. But here the good news. This is a happy prophecy. A happy vision. What the people are hearing with this image. Something is lying in wait. Something that, that, that is multifaceted. That has, has different color horses and different riders and different ideas. It's hidden. It's coming. You can barely see it. But is God done with the exile of Jerusalem? Yes. They, they are so pleased and blessed to know that that is coming to an end. Um, they'll learn more of what that restoration looks like, but Jeremiah, his prophecy is coming to an end. Let's go to our next slide. Let's see this next image, these next uh, animals up here. All right, what animals are in this picture before I start reading it? Horses again. Okay, good, good. So this is Zechariah 6. What I got to tell you before I read this um, this image is from Doors English Bible, which is from 1866. Uh, it's an imprint. I think the technical term for that is lithograph, maybe. 
Um, but unfortunately, it's not in color, so you have to use your imagination. Can you do that today? Yes? Use, use your imagination? Um, unless you're colorblind, then, you know, this is what you see every day. So that's what it is. Um, so here we are, Zechariah 6. Uh, please stand for the reading of God's Word. I'll have the image up here, but open your Bible to Zechariah 6 and follow along. Always a good idea to bring your Bible to church. And you can use your phone. We have lots of tools for that. <laughs> Zechariah 6, 1 through 8. Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four chariots came out from between two mountains. And the mountains were mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black horses, the third white horses, and the fourth chariot dappled horses, all of them strong. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are going out to the four winds of heaven after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. The chariot with the black horses goes toward the north country, the white one goes after them, and the dappled ones go toward the south country. When the strong horses came out, they were impatient to go and patrol the earth. And he said, Go patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. Then he cried to me, Behold, those who go toward the north country have set my spirit at rest in the north country. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. So this is one of the awake visions. Is this happening? Is this vision coming to him at nighttime or daytime? Daytime. Daytime. We learned that in chapter 4 that these are in the daytime. So we get more directions. We get more clarity, more explanation about what is going on. And uh, we will notice uh, quite quickly that the horses in the first vision, I mean, they're just even obscured in general. It's hard to see those horses behind these trees. But in this vision, uh, we learn these horses are in a different setting, a different situation. Uh, that, other, that other picture had a rider sort of like coming off the horse, you know, get, getting off of it. Uh, and this one, are the horses prepared in any way? Yes. Yeah. They're strapped to chariots. Uh, I, does taking the saddle a horse take a little bit of time? Oh. Yeah, it, ta- it takes some time. You know, it takes some preparation. I would imagine strapping a horse to a chariot takes a little bit of preparation. Yeah. yeah. So these horses are prepared. This wasn't a spur of the moment thing. And so th- there's a difference there. That those horses were sort of uh, uh, done. That they're unsaddled. These are strapped to chariots. And that other vision, those horses had just gotten done with patrolling. These horses are about to go out. They're they're anxious to go out. And so in Zechariah 1, the promise is something is about to happen. You know, they patrolled, they surveyed the land, they're developing a plan. We're waiting, we're lying in wait. In this vision, something is beginning to happen. Something is changing, something is in the air. Also, we see the topography has changed. Before, the horses really could have been out there in that dry creek bed. Where are these horses coming down from? Mountains. They're coming from high and lifted up. And uh, let's see. I want to make sure you guys see this as well. Um, we, we know in the ancient world that, that horses in general are weapons of war. A cavalry was terrible. They could run you over. Chariots are like tanks. Char- chariots, I mean, that is, that's the end of the world. And if you're on foot and there's chariots, unless you're like by a swamp, you're toast. Game over. So we see this. Do these horses look sort of intimidating? Yeah. Look, I mean, they look tough. But in the ancient world, it'd be like watching a bunch of tanks come rolling out of a mountain down your street. Are you toast? Yes. You better turn and run. But we see something about this mountain. It's one thing that their stronghold is a mountain. What is their mountain made out of? Bronze. Bronze. Now, for us, we're like, well, we've got tungsten carpide, and we can make things out of graphene and cool stuff. Bronze was, was top-notch technology. If, if your shield is made out of bronze, if, if your stronghold is made out of bronze, but this is an unimaginable mountain made of bronze. So, so here's what this means, is whatever these horses are attacking or doing or going out for, if you could even imagine making them turn tail and run, will you ever be able to defeat them? No. no. The, these horses' victory, these, these horses ever being swayed from the mission is sure. Their stronghold isn't a, a fort made out of sticks. It's not where they're hidden behind some trees. So we've got a whole mountain of bronze. Come and get us. You're not going to mess with these horses, these chariots. Um, 
What else do we learn about the, these horses? Their colors go different directions. We'll talk more about these colors in a moment. The black go to the north, and then they're followed by the white to the north. So we see different things are happening. Uh, and then the dappled go to the south, which we'll talk more about what these words mean. They go to the south. Uh, but the red is not mentioned in this sending. But overall, these horses, are they are they're like, oh, we have to go out again? No. They're like racehorses, you know. Uh, if you ever have seen a horse at a, at a starting line ready to go, are they stamping their foot? Are they ready to go? Are they excited? You know, do, are they going to want you to play red light, green light? No, as soon as you open that gate, they are gone. That's how amped up these horses are. They're professional athletes waiting to go. And But we look at the world at the end of this story, and it says, Behold, those who go toward the north country have set my spirit at anger. No, it says my spirit at rest. So I just want to point out that, that contrast between the first image and the next one. The first one, the Lord is exceedingly angry because the, the nations are at peace and it's a false peace and it's a peace that's not accomplishing God's goals. This one, God is sending out these spiritual forces, these powerful undefeatable spiritual forces. And at the end of it, God's spirit is at rest. His plans are accomplished. The nations now know something. They now see something. So the first one, the nations have rest and peace. This one, God's spirit has rest and peace. We see how these, these images complement each other. They're two sides getting ready and now something is happening. But what is happening backstage? What do we learn? Just like we would learn, let's go to this next slide. Just like we would learn at a concert or backstage something about the artist that we wouldn't normally see. What do we learn about God, the one at the center of the stage, uh, from these visions? One, we learn God is pervasive. Do, do these horses, they just patrol one county? No. No. They patrol the whole earth. They, they go everywhere. And this is important because where have God's people been exiled to? feels like everywhere. There could be the people in Jerusalem saying, I wonder what happened to our brothers uh, who, were, who were in the Galilee. Or they didn't say, what, about that? what about my cousin back in Babylon? God is there. God's eyes see. We see this expressly in, in verse 5 of chapter 6. And the angel said to me, these are going out to the four winds of heaven. And now we hear about the wind and we're like, yeah, the wind is for flying a kite. For the ancient world, if you wanted to cross an ocean, what is the only tool you have? The wind blowing your ship. That was the strongest force they had. We're like, well, we've got gasoline and coal and nuclear. It was wind power or ore power. That's it. So they are, they are amongst the most powerful forces in the world. And even today, will a hurricane mess you up? Is Hurricane Harvey sort of a big deal? Yes. So we still understand the wind is powerful. But these people in Jerusalem who feel beat down, whose walls are crushed, whose temple is nothing, who feel like faraway kings decide their fate, are seeing the image that God is pervasive. You, you wonder if your God knows about Darius. I know what he had for breakfast. God is pervasive. We also see that among the heavenlies, there is power amidst peace. We see this in, in verse 11 of chapter 1. It says this, And they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth remains at rest. And, and this matters for, for Zechariah's people. The question they could have could be, Darius came in, kicked out Babylon. Darius is a pagan king. He even thinks in some sense that he is divine. Certainly he has other gods. And we've been done wrong. The people of Jerusalem have been done wrong by king after king after king. And even their own kings have done wrong. And right now as they are building, as they are beginning work on the walls and the temple, they are in danger that Darius or some other king will smash them again. We may be done wrong again. So they may wonder, are we just benefiting? Is Zechariah just up here telling us this because he's taking advantage of what a secular king has done? You know, the market was good. It was time to start a business. You know, the, the pe people seemed like they were behind us, so we, we started this ministry. There, there was money there, so we figured we had to do something. 
Are they just benefiting from the situation around them in the world? Or is God still a God of power? So even though this King Darius would say, my reign is full of peace, God is not out of control. So they need not take the prosperity of Darius to mean that Darius has a situation under control. God does. God is patrolling. His forces are not unaware. And then we have authority and submission. Oh, and this is most seen in uh, 6.5. And like we said, we're looking at a a picture of heavenly things. Do angels normally blow people's mind? Yes. There's a reason they have to say fear not. It's crazy uh, to look at. But, But he's watching these heavenly forces go out. And so what he sees in their character, in their nature, is... And the angel answered and said to me, These are going out to the four winds of heaven after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. Are they operating under their own authority? No. Are they ready and raring to go? Yes. But even then, it says in verse 7 of chapter 6, when the strong horses came out, they were impatient. That the heavenly forces are ready to go about God's plan. But they wait until they hear, go patrol the earth. That's the God you serve. Legions of angels who are are ancient and anxious to see the plan accomplish and occur. Who even in the heavenly throne room say, is it time for mercy? Is it time now? Is it time to go out? Wait for God on the throne to say go. Wait for God to say now patrol. Or now right out of the stronghold. There there is authority and submission. And then the colors, they hint at what the next step will be like. If you know the history of of the Persian Empire, just in short, are are they going to have an easy go of it? Or are they going to run into somebody named Alexander? Run into somebody named Alexander. There's going to be bloodshed, there's going to be siege works, there's going to be plague, there's going to be murder, there's going to be betrayal. Things are going to get worse before they get better for the Persian kingdom. But just from Zechariah's perspective, he's getting this glimmer from a backstage pass of what's coming. So red, or the ruddy horse, um, that in this vision is, is called up but not sent out. But if God has this horse in his storehouse, what's in your vein? What, what's, what color is it? Red. Red. This is bloodshed. A lot of commentators would call it warfare or, or, or physical violence. What about black, or, or the, the, another way it can be translated as dusky. Whenever you go to a funeral, do you wear pink or do you wear black? This is, this is death. This is destruction. And now white. We'll talk about how white can be good. But in terms of something that's coming to judge the nations and, and, and topple kings, if your child is outside in the sun and they're not drinking enough water, uh, what, what color can they turn if it's not good? Pale. It's, something's wrong. Something's not right. They need energy. They need nourishment. But also, we'll see in a moment how it can stand for victory, certainly. And then dappled or spotted. Uh, if your kid has red blotches all over their body, what do they got? Measles. Chicken pox. It's not, we don't usually look at somebody who's speckled and say, they must be part cheetah. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. There's disease going on there. But like I said before, the purpose of having the backstage pass isn't, isn't to overemphasize the smoke machines and, and, and what's going on there. We're there to see what is going on at the center of the stage. So for Zechariah's people who have been beat down, who have been broken, they may wonder, one, does God even see or notice? Oh yeah, he's got forces going all over the earth. And they may wonder, well, what if, you know, what if Darius is God's last shot at restoring us? No, they're learning. God has all sorts of tools. And we may wonder, we may question, well, is God going to use war? Is he going to use bloodshed? That's a challenge. But we've got to remember, for Zechariah's people, part of their question for God is, we've been so abused by these kings. What will you do? And we'll see how this story answers that. What's happening for the people in Jerusalem that day? Let's go to this next slide. So I've seen sort of the, the images and the pictures in there. Let's talk about the show. So now we move back to the backstage, and now we're thinking about what would this look like for the people in Jerusalem? Uh, 11 months, second year, 1-7 uh, is where we get this from. Uh, just a reminder, whose reign is that? Is it, is it 
uh, King Cyrus or King Darius? Darius? Darius is the king. And the question for the people, which we talked about this last week, is God is calling us to a mission. We're to rebuild the walls. We're to rebuild the people. We're to rebuild the temple. But are they sure if any of that is legal yet? No. They're in this awkward spot. Cyrus had said go. Artaxerxes, the next king, had said no. And now we've got a new king, and we're not sure what he's going to say. But they've got this prophet saying God's word declares we must begin. But God will sort out that king thing. But the time is now. And they also would have a question about what about the 70 years? Uh, Jeremiah prophesied there are 70 years of exile coming. And what we see in this very first image in Zechariah is the ending is now. The time for renewal is now. Now, if you know the story of Scripture, this will take several hundred years. They'll be waiting for some guy that you've probably talked about before. But, but they'll see that something is changing. Uh, that's why in verse uh, 12 and 13 it says this, You have been angry these 70 years. And the Lord answered, Gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. Does Zechariah get to hear all the plan? Mm-mm. He just knows something's changing. Something gracious is happening. And that connects to this next idea. And both of these visions are things obscure. Is it completely clear? No. There's the myrtle trees. They're down in the glen. These horses are there and they're going out. But there's no month. There's no calendar. There's no timetable. Uh, and also what we see, and this is important for us. Uh, you know, don't, don't answer out loud. You can nod your head yes. Who, who here feels like you're, you're waiting on God for something? We've been, you know, you're waiting to, to, for your child to graduate. You're, you're waiting for, for healing. You're waiting for an answer. Guess what? The heavenly forces are even more excited to see God's plan than we are. Amen. That they are so antsy. The angels, if you imagine them as horses, are stamping their foot because they know this is going to be awesome. Yeah. They're ready to go. And so for the people of Jerusalem... They could have the very big question of, is God going to do anything? And Zechariah is reminding them, yes. And he's got forces you don't know about. And he's got, he's got plans that you can't even fathom. But, but the time of judgment, the time for restoration is beginning now. God is coming. That's why the promise is in verse 17. My city shall again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. Now, if you know your Bible, the ultimate restoration of God's people doesn't come whenever they finish the walls under Zechariah. It doesn't come whenever they finish the temple under Haggai. It comes whenever one who calls his own body the temple of God comes and visits Jerusalem. And his name is Jesus. So let's connect this to the gospel. The people of God are waiting for God to do something. Which is that true for us today? Yes. Are we waiting for God to do something? Yes. yes. We'll talk about what that is. This image, is you can see now how this is completely connected to Zechariah. I'm going to read this from Revelation 6. I apologize for not being on the screen, but you can follow along. Revelation 6. Listen to this. I'm going to ask you what is connected here. What animal is connected? And I hope you find out quickly. Uh, Revelation 6. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals and heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked and behold, a white horse and its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he came out conquering and to conquer. And then skipping down uh, to verse 10. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. Who were to be blessed? Who were to be killed as they themselves had been. What animal connects us to Zechariah? Horses. Horses. All the color horses are here. I just read the white one. Because in Zechariah's day, it, it's not quite clear. We got a good guess. Maybe that's the good guy horse. But in Revelation, what's the name of the good guy on the white horse? 
Jesus. He's coming. As we sang in the song, we believe he's coming back again. And here's how this connects to the gospel. Here's how we connect to Zechariah. We as a church could say, how long? Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come. And in this story, we have the people under the altar saying, how long? Our blood has been shed. The testimony rejected. Is the rider coming? Yes. Jesus is coming. The church today is waiting for God to do something. We have been given Jesus. Over 2,000 years ago, he came, changed everything, paid for your sins, defeated sin and death. But are we still waiting? Yes. Part of the story of the Gospels, we are a people that is waiting. We're questioning. When is it over? When is the next step? And here's the challenge we get from Revelation. For Zechariah's people, it was God's doing something. Be patient. Get to building the wall. But for us, what we learn from this passage in Revelation 6 is sometimes the patience that God requires of his people is that they look past their present circumstances to the eternal truth of what God will do. Even if you face death for professing the gospel, does that change what God will do? No. The rider on the white horse is coming. No more myrtle trees. No more mountains of bronze. He is coming. So let's not miss this. Let's go to this next slide. Don't miss this. Unbeliever. The nations in the first vision. They're at peace. But are they in trouble with God? Yes. That says God is exceedingly angry. So unbeliever, you say, I think Jesus is a good idea or I'm not sure that that God's for me. My life's pretty good. Do you mistake the peace and prosperity in your life? My marriage is okay. My bank account is okay. You know, my, I've, never been, I've never been arrested as a reason to neglect God. You say, I'm pretty good. If you're pretty good without Jesus and hear this the right way, you will come before the rider and the white horse and you will be pretty damned. Don't mistake your present prosperity. I got a good job. I got it together. People look up to me as a reason to say, I can do God later. He's coming. He's coming. But then believer, and many of you are today, and you've been baptized, you profess who Jesus is. Think of your present circumstances. The worst thing. The worst thing. You're sick. Someone got cancer. That kid won't listen. Do you allow that to challenge God's potency? Your present circumstances, does it ever make you say, maybe God can't? Can't is not a God word. Now you can play with philosophy, but in your life, in the circumstances of your life, can't is not a God word. Zechariah's people have the challenge and the mission. Rebuild the temple. Rebuild the people. Rebuild the wall. And then we think, but Darius, but Darius, but Darius. can't is not a God word. If he, if he tasks you to rebuild the wall, he's going to provide for it. He's got heavenly forces you do not know about. He has a plan that is bigger than you. Do we allow that? Nothing in your life should make you say, well, God can't come through. Those same heavenly forces, those horses, those chariots are still there. In your life, you say, well, I've been given a mission at Baton. You know, we say the two missions of the church, evangelism and discipleship. I, I, there's no way I can reach my neighbor. Who here was a neighbor that couldn't be reached by Jesus, but then somebody slapped him in the head and told you about it? That's what happened. All of us in our life looked impossible from a human perspective. Some of y'all were messed up. But now you're here in church worshiping Jesus. The, the present circumstances don't, aren't a reason for us to say God can't. And then with discipleship, say, oh, I, I, I don't think I can pray. I, I feel like I'm never growing in Christ. How can I encourage my brother and sister? That looks impossible. Maybe you look at the state of the church of Bateman and you say, they're so messed up. They're so immature. I'm so mad at those people. Is that ever a reason for us to look at God and say, you can't? No. No. 
God can redeem His people. He redeemed Zechariah's people. He renewed His people. And likewise, He can renew this church. The rider on the white horse is coming. I don't know what your circumstances are, but be patient. He's coming. Continue the mission. For Zechariah, that was the bricks, the walls, the temple. For us, that's evangelism, that's discipleship. He's coming. Uh, So let's have our time of invitation.